Doesn't that video make you wish you were still in college? <laughs> well, you're not, so move on. <clears throat> but the college year has ended. You can tell by looking at typically where college students sit in services is, is getting emptier. So we just lied to you with the video. There's nothing going on. No, really there is, uh, but they're gone. Most of them, but 600 students were here most Tuesday nights all throughout the year. And I, and I say this not in an exaggeratory way. There really is something uh, that I've never seen before going on among college-age students. There, there's a hunger for truth. There's a hunger for Jesus. And you can see it. I mean, not just the numbers that come, but the, in, the, the sincerity on their faces and their participation in worship. I, I, I was in campus ministry for 17 years, my first years in ministry, and we never saw anything like that. There really is something going on. So that's something to be excited about and anticipatory of what God is doing, going to do in their lives. Uh, about 10 years ago, a guy named Hampton Sides wrote a book, true story, a historical book, on a Navy expedition to the North Pole in 1879. And it was an expedition that was captained by a guy named George DeLong. And George DeLong's entire expedition was based on a map by a cartographer named August Peterman. And this guy had made popular, and it had been around for centuries. The author of the book says it was part of the public mind for centuries, but he popularized it. It was a very popular map, but a very mistaken map, because his idea, nobody had really been to the North Pole. There had been expeditions up there, but nobody had really been to the North Pole. And he was basing his map on his theory, like I said, been around for centuries as part of the popular mindset, but it was a theory that, as you see the Gulf Stream going up through the Atlantic and another type Gulf Stream going up through the Pacific, that if you followed them, it would be provide a warm enough water path to get beyond the ice, and then once you got beyond the ice, north of the ice, a warm water basin opened up where the North, north Pole would be, where both of those streams come together and bring uh, warm water. So Captain DeLong based his entire journey on that. This is a picture of the boat, the SS, USS Jeanette, uh, which causes all kinds of jokes in my family because my wife's name's Jeanette and the expedition that, that wasn't. Uh, but you have here this ship in the San Francisco Harbor before leaving, and when they finally took the journey, what people didn't know was that they were following a map to a world that didn't exist. They found out it didn't exist. Reality always wins. And they, when they eventually got up and there wasn't a warm water base and they just got more and more into thick ice, eventually the ice surrounded the ship, crushed the ship, and the ship sank. That's the story of a ship based on a faulty map, but we kind of live in a time, in fact, there's always been true of every culture. There's these cultural maps that are just part of the public imagination. They're very popular and very mistaken that are maps to the good life, a map to how to be happy, a map to what my life needs to be like, what I need in order to live the good life. And they're, 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 they're maps that we follow without getting the map out and looking at it. We just, it's just the messages we get from TV shows, movies, social media, songs. All of our lives, we've been getting bombarded with that message, and it just becomes unconsciously something that we follow. We just assume it to be true. We just assume it to be the map to the good life. In, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus gets really hardcore. Now, he got hardcore back in chapter 12, too. We looked at that. But he's, he says some hard things. And the reason why is because he's challenging our popular but very mistaken cultural maps. And he's trying to show us that if we follow the cultural maps, it's going to lead us to a world that doesn't exist. It's going to shipwreck and, and, and sink our lives. Uh, but it's the way he says it in Luke 14, 26, that's kind of really hard to catch, and, and it's offensive to anybody who reads it. Before we get to it, let's pick up in the verse before it, verse 25, where Luke narrates, kind of the, sets it up. He says that large crowds were traveling with Jesus. So ever since Luke chapter 9, Jesus says he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to be beaten, crucified, he's going to rise on the third day, 
And so Jesus has been making his way, these chapters in Luke, toward Jerusalem. And large crowds are traveling with him. And they're traveling with him because they've come to believe there's something rare and special in Jesus. But the miracles he's doing, the things that he's teaching, and because he keeps talking about his destination in Jerusalem, they're expecting something rare and special to happen when he gets there. So these large crowds are traveling with him, but, but Jesus, in spite of the large crowd, as exciting as it is to have a large crowd, turns to them and says something where he's not only not hiding the fine print, but he's putting the fine print, the, the hardest part about what it means to not just not travel with him, but actually follow him, and he puts that front and center. And it's, it's this, the next thing. So it says he's turning to them, and he says this hard statement, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus, he, he called anybody who follows him his disciple. To be what we would call a Christian uh, is to be, in Jesus' language, to be a disciple. It wasn't just the 12 apostles. They were disciples too, but there were a lot more disciples than them. Any follower of Jesus, anybody that we would say is a true Christian, uh, is, what in Jesus' language, a disciple. So this, this becomes uncomfortable because Jesus is not just talking about some special tier. He's talking about anybody who follows him has to hate their family. And of course, it just sounds absurd. It doesn't just sound absurd. It sounds morally evil to say something like that, that to hate your family, to hate your kids, hate your parents, hate your brothers, sisters, to hate yourself, it doesn't resonate as true with us. And, and, and why does he have to use the word hate? He could soften it and say something a little different. We get the point. But why have to use the word hate? Especially when he says back in chapter 6, verse 35, to his disciples to love their enemies. He says in chapter 10, verse 27, to love your neighbor and to love yourself. So it almost sounds like a contradiction. There he said to love yourself. Here he's saying to hate your own life. What's he doing? Well, experienced readers of the Bible who have read more than once Jesus' teachings know that Jesus does this a lot. He, when he really wanted to emphasize something serious, he wanted to get your attention, and the way he did it was to speak in hyperbole. It's like what he says uh, in Matthew and Mark where he says that if your, your foot or hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. Now, the disciples knew he wasn't being literal. There, there's no disciple in the rest of the Bible that ever cut off any body parts. They knew he wasn't being literal, but they did know he was being serious, which is why Matthew quotes Jesus saying that in two separate occasions in the Gospel of Matthew. There's something about that Jesus knows he's saying something absurd because he wants us to go, wait, what? He wants his listeners, he wants his readers, uh, Luke wants his readers to lean in and say, wait, what was that? And now we're paying attention. And he wants us to be offended in a way because it's when we're offended that we have to wrestle with what he just said. If we're not offended, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. So to wrestle with what he just said, it might help to know that Jesus is using a very popular ancient Semitic expression in his day. It had been around for centuries. You see it in Old Testament books. The, 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 when in that expression, if you wanted to convey a strong preference for one over another, you said it like this, I love A, but hate B. And what you meant was, I strongly prefer, strongly love, strongly want A over B. So, for example, just one example is in Genesis chapter 29, where it says that, that Jacob loved Rachel, but hated Leah. 
Now, he didn't hate Leah. He does a lot of things for Leah. And, but it's the language that said he really strongly preferred Rachel over Leah. So Jesus is saying here that it's something like the softer way that he says it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anybody, anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We don't have such a hard time with the more than language. We, not saying it's easy, not saying that doesn't trip us up a bit, but we can understand how the person who's the God of the universe created everything, created you, had a, would have a right to say that. The problem we have here is, the, is not worthy of me, of me language. And what Jesus means by that is, you're not really following me. See, the truth is, the hard part in, in this world is that Jesus is saying, in this world, you're not going to last long if you want to follow me, if you love something else in this world more. You're just not going to be able to follow me. Because in, in this world, to follow Jesus is to live for God in a world that has, since the beginning, been in rebellion against God. Not just human beings, not just every system of government, but spiritual beings as well that we can't see. That's the biblical story. So to follow Jesus in a world that's in rebellion against God, to follow God, to live for God in a world that's in rebellion against God, if you love things in this world more, you're not going to be able to do that. It's, it's going to be a problem for you. Just to follow God in a world in rebellion against God is going to be, for everybody, Jesus says, a big problem for you that you're going to have to face. There's different degrees at different times in our lives when we have to face it. I read in the Wall Street Journal on Friday a really sad story about a pastor in, in Nigeria. He's a 45-year-old pastor. His name's Gideon Dewal, and he's pastor of a church, Christ Apostolic Church, and on Christmas Eve this past December, so just, you know, what, six months ago, five months ago, uh, he's on Christmas Eve at the church getting ready for the Christmas service the next day, and he notices a group of Muslim Fulani, uh, Ful sorry, Fulani herdsmen show up. They had been doing um, terrorism, and they have been terrorizing the region, and they showed up outside the church, and he was obviously concerned, not 100% sure what to do, but then the article said 30 minutes later, they got their AK-47s out and began shooting at everything and everyone. Lit the church on fire, lit crops on fire, lit houses nearby on fire. Eventually, when they left, Pastor DeWile went home and to, at his house found his wife and all five of his daughters killed. And you can see here, there's a picture here in the paper that of, uh, there should be a picture there, uh, of this is the funeral of his family, uh, the graves that are dug, and people are there. And he says in the article that everything in his life, everything he had in this world is gone. Jesus isn't hiding the fine print. Here, 2,000 years later, Jesus is is warning everybody that wants to follow him in this world that's in rebellion against God, there are going to be problems and you're going to end up coming to a fork in your road. It's not going to be easy to follow him. It's not going to be easy unless you are at least at a point where you are willing to say goodbye to everything else in order to have Jesus. Now, I understand that is a really scary thing. Nobody, I can't even say this from up front without being a little bit nervous and scared and worried about that statement. But that's what Jesus is, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that if you want to follow me, you can't have it be something that you want and you'll follow me as long as you have it. You have to be willing to say goodbye to everything because I'm God, and to follow God in a world in rebellion against God, there are going to be issues. There are going to be problems. It doesn't have to be the tragedy that Pastor DeWall faced. In fact, in Nigeria, the article went on to say that Christians in Nigeria, just this past year, over 4,100 have been killed because they're Christians. 3,300 kidnapped because they're Christians. So when a Nigerian Christian 
They've had to make a choice now to be an identified Nigeria Christian. You've already had to make that choice that Jesus is talking about here. For us, maybe not so much, at least not right now. Maybe coming in the future, but not right now. For us, it might be something not so dramatic. It might just be that you have this cultural map, this, this thing in your mind that says, in order for me to be happy, I need to have this. And so I'll follow Jesus as long as I can have this too, do this too. You have an expectation for how your life should go. And if your life isn't going that way, and following Jesus might be making it go that way, it may not go that way, you might stop following Jesus or maybe start following Jesus less in order so that you can have your life go the way that You've kind of always wanted it to go, the way you expect it to go, the way the culture tells you it should go if you're going to be happy, if you're going to find the good life. But here's the problem, is that you live in a world that is in rebellion against God, spiritually and among humans as well. I I saw a movie, you might think I watch TV all the time, but I watched a movie this week where there's a mob figure, you know, we've all seen a thousand scenes like this. A mob figure is interrogating a guy to find out where the other people that are his friends are hiding so he can get them. They've caught one guy and he wants to get the rest. So he's interrogating the guy, beating up the guy, doing all kinds of tortures on the guy. The guy's not giving up. The guy's not giving up the friends. He's doing a really good job. And then something happens where the guy exposes by accident what's ultimate in his life, and that's his family. And once this mob guy, leader, found out that his family, what was ultimate in his life, and who his family was, it was over. It was only a matter of time before the guy, he could threaten his family enough where the guy would find out where his friends are, and then he found his, the guy would divulge where his friends are, and he went and got his friends. Now, that's typical of movies like that, right? We've seen a thousand scenes like that. Scenes like that. But see, Jesus knows, again, we live in a world of spiritual rebellion, Jesus knows that's how the devil is, exactly like that. That the devil knows whatever it is that you say, I'll follow Jesus if I can have this too. You've already lost. Whatever else is ultimate in your life over Jesus, as long as you can have that, you'll follow Jesus. That ultimate thing, that's going to be used by the devil to manipulate you and eventually destroy you. And Jesus knows that. So Jesus isn't hiding the fine print. He's being honest. If you want the ultimate, and that's Jesus, you're gonna have to realize you can't have something else be ultimate. You have to be willing to say goodbye, or you're gonna be manipulated and destroyed by whatever else it is that that is ultimate to you. The author David Foster Wallace says this in his own kind of way. He wasn't a Christian. He's dead now. He didn't have any theological agenda whatsoever, but he was giving, in 2005, a commencement address at Kenyon College, and it's become famous because it's it's so unusual the way a non-Christian would say what he says in this. Again, it's a little different terminology than what Jesus, what I'm using today, uh, talking about this passage of Jesus, but he says this. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. I would say, not having something be ultimate. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, And you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, and you will feel weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. What David Foster Wallace is saying in 2005 is something that Augustine, Augustine, however you say it, nobody really knows. Anybody who says they know, they don't know. But back in the 400s, he wrote in his book called Confessions about 
ordering of our loves, that, that we, we order all of our loves. We love lots of things, but those loves have an order to them. And if those loves become out of order, we love something more that we should love less than something else. If, that that when, when loves get out of order, they become disordered loves. They become disordered loves that ruin us. They become disordered loves that bring disordered lives, is what Augustine said. And he's talking, no doubt, about what Jesus is talking about in our verse today. James K.A. Smith says it well in his book called You Are What You Love. Good book. Uh, I don't agree with everything in it, but it's a good book. I had to say that. But it's a, it's a good book. But he, he's talking about when Jesus says to love him more than anything else, that this really strong love for him more than anything else where he can use hyperbolic language about hating even, that when he says to love him more than anything else, what he's really doing is showing us how to be truly human. Because to be fully human is to love most the one who made you and the one for whom you were made. That's just common sense, right? That to be truly human is to love most, to have the one be ultimate, the one who made you and the one for whom you were made. And now, in, in everybody's life, there's this kind of beacon, this kind of north star, this thing pulling us. It's this desire for the good life, this desire for happiness. Nobody, just like he says, nobody cannot worship. Nobody cannot be lovers of what is ultimate because we all have this beacon, beacon that's pulling us toward the good life, pulling us toward happiness. It's, it's this internal intuition, homing device, that the Bible calls shalom. Shalom is this word that means not just peace, but it's this word that means flourishing. This word, this Hebrew word that means well-being, ultimate well-being, flourishing. The way things should be are the way things are when there is shalom. It's, it's Old Testament shorthand for what Jesus calls the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. This idea that God has created us for shalom Shalom is why you were made, what you were made for, and it's why Jesus came, and it's why Jesus died, and it's why Jesus rose from the dead. He's, he rose from the dead because he's bringing shalom. He's bringing the kingdom of God to this broken world through a resurrection of those who are his disciples forever and a resurrected world. And, and so when Jesus gives his map to shalom, if we wanted to make it like an equation, and you've maybe seen this before, I didn't make it up, but this is Jesus' map to shalom. Jesus plus nothing will equal everything because Jesus is shalom. Jesus is the kingdom of God. Jesus is the ultimate one. He's the one who made you, and he's the one for whom you were made. And in any other ultimate thing, any other map that we take is leading us to a world that doesn't exist. So not only is Jesus plus nothing going to equal everything, but everything in this world minus Jesus is going to end in nothing. This is a world that doesn't exist. So we all have this choice. And I don't know where you are in your, in your process of trying to figure out how much you trust the words of Jesus, whether or not they're worth believing or not. We're all at different places on that, and, and we're all working through that. But are you in a place where you, you, you know what? I, I, I don't think all the cultural maps have shown any kind of veracity at all because I haven't seen anybody that's truly living the happy life no matter how much they have, no matter how much they've done. Everybody's trying to find more because they're empty still. And you might have come to the point where you believe, no, I think the resurrection really happened. I think the disciples that all suffered because they wouldn't stop proclaiming the resurrection actually saw Jesus' resurrection. I think, therefore, the words of Jesus are true. And you're ready to take the big swan dive into the promises of Jesus. You're ready to take the big swan dive into these words of Jesus when he says that Jesus is more than anything or anyone else in this world because he's bringing shalom. He's bringing the kingdom of God that the last chapter of the Bible 
tells us. I just want to read the first five verses, parts of the first five verses. In this vision that the Apostle John had, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. This is all poetic language, imagery, imagination. Showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's Jesus in the book of Revelation down the middle of the great street of the city. It goes on, it says, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. That's that imagery again of this tree that brings life forever, bearing 12 crops of fruit. That just means for all the people of God, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. It goes on, they, the people of God, the resurrected people of God, when Jesus brings heaven back to earth, will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. They will have an identity, a new life, a whole existence based on his name, who he is. And notice this, and they will reign forever and ever. To reign forever and ever with the name of God on you, the identity that God gives you without any curse, seeing the face of God in a world where this water of life flows from the presence of God that brings healing to the nations, that brings the tree of life. This is all imagery because the Bible can't really explain it. It just gives us things to imagine that restores your life. Jesus' hard words are giving you the map to shalom, this shalom. Don't miss it. 